If I am not mistaken, this show will be going live on a Monday, Monday in late March. And uh, March is that kind of time of year where we get we where if you live in the northern part of the country, you get you get you get in, you get, you know, that antsy anticipation for spring to finally happen. But whereas where I am, I am expecting the dreaded heat to hit soon. And something about the desert was it was where I learned how to pick locks. Not in the military, not in special operations, not in Ranger Battalion, although maybe I should hold a grudge. But uh, this show, the Redacted Culture Cast, is exactly about that. Redacted and culture. Oops, that sounds weird. So, uh, would you introduce yourself today? Absolutely. What's going on, guys? This is uh, Marcus Singletary. I am the owner of Cloaked Entry Co. Some of you guys may know me as Sky Pirate Actual on Instagram. Um, typically speaking, I teach... Uh, Covert entry tactics, uh, surreptitious entry. Yeah, they are different. Um, and lock picking. Most people just know me as the lock picking guy. So, <laughs> yeah, everything in that world gets boiled down to lock picking, even though lock picking is a very small portion of what we do. Um, and during my day job, I work over in USASOC in the Army as a foreign weapons instructor. So, if you guys want to find me, skypirate underscore actual on Instagram or at cloaked entry co on Instagram. Or over to our website www.cloakentryco.com nice all righty so i have i already know exactly where this is going to start <laughs> um but if that's going to be if that's going i'm just gonna i'm not even going to worry about it if you've been listening to the show you know where to find our stuff if you don't um i'll, I'll there are there's always links in the entry below we've got our locals page for those who want to support the channel we got our merch and then you know there's us on instagram so uh, you made a statement, and I think it might have cut out for a half a second, but we'll make do as we go. You said the uh, cloaked entry versus surreptitious entry. Yeah, co covert entry versus surreptitious. There, there are some small minor differences. Okay, am I am I saying it wrong? Is it not surreptitious, or is it? I feel like I. It's like one of those words where I learned it in the military. Yeah. No, so this is like so for for most people, surreptitious and covert. They're, they use them synonymously, right? When there are very small differences between the two, so that surreptitious can be covert, but co covert doesn't, it won't necessarily be surreptitious, if that makes sense. Uh, it makes sense. In, uh, uh, um, have you seen anybody write anything out in formal logic before? Like if A, then B, if B, then C, it's kind of, you, you would know it's yeah. very, it looks very mathematical. Mm hmm. Um, so, so I can understand it in concept as in, well, not in concept. I can understand it in its mechanism. Like mm -hmm. I can understand, uh, you say, you said all surreptitious are surreptitious, all surreptitious is covert, but not all covert is surreptitious. Is that the way you're saying? Correct. Okay. So like all labs are dogs, but not all dogs are labs. Correct. Okay. So now I don't know what I, I now. So now, now by saying that you're, it's a distinction, it's a healthy, it's an important distinction. There you go, a philosopher at bringing up distinctions. But what um, what is surreptitious, and then what is covert? How would you how would you, and why is there a difference between those important? Okay, so um, we're gonna get real nerdy here for a second. So covert just typically means not seen. You can be heard in some context, but for the most part, it means not so not seen, not heard doing the act. That's covert. Surreptitious kind of breaks down to where it depends on how much evidence you're actually leaving behind doing the covert act, right? So that'll also come into who's looking for the clues that you left behind. So let's just say I busted into someone's house using lockpicks. Now, if there was someone that was really turned and tuned into forensics, they could technically pull that lock, pull the, uh, pull the pens, and be able to tell that that lock had been picked. They wouldn't be able to tell exactly when it had been picked, but they could tell it, could be, and it had been picked. Mm -hmm. but that's evidence that's left behind. If I were to lloyd a door, or uh, you guys might know it as like credit carding a door or some shit like that. If you do that multiple times, you're going to end up leaving scars on the inside of the, uh, of the frame because it's constantly scraping up against that in order to get to the latch, correct? So that's evidence left behind. So that's something that someone who has a trained eye can see that. So that's what I mean by covert can't be surreptitious necessarily because even if it's covert and no one saw me getting in there is still evidence left behind that the trained eye could catch all right so surreptitious so okay so surreptitious the idea of a surreptitious thing is that 
it's it's both they don't see you necessarily going in and then there's not a lot of information for them to see you leaving correct or, or as in as in someone is going to have greater difficulty arriving at you know the uh the liberty scene or whatever you want to call it later and being like uh i don't have any information to pull out of this right and so typically speaking when you think of surreptitious it's not like that's like super duper spot and yeah some of that stuff is mm -hmm. let's just say you left the door open and mm -hmm. i walked the house. there would be no evidence that i was there if i made sure i didn't do anything on the inside that i entered that way okay so, so all right, so so are you familiar with um like the little the flipper device the little yeah. the, okay so um I have yeah I have one I have one in my I have this like chest bag this little um Lululemon sling bag I started using one of those <laughs> I believe it or not I started I started carrying one of those uh, when I went to Ukraine because I was like it just it was just, it just made sense plus it's easier to blend in with the population right uh but you know like you know i'm also like a six foot tall white dude with a beard and tattoos they're like that guy's american you know <laughs> <laughs> uh but but the point being said is that like now you know i i've I, I've thought of different ways to outfit it like do i put lock picks and then i put one of those in there or do i put this and that in it so um that um <clears throat> so that that flipper device you know, you can use it like you can clone your hotel key card, right? And then does that so does that 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 would involve a leave behind trail because somebody could go into the system, generally speaking, and look at what code was used to open it. Right. So either that or let's just say they have a log of entries, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 um, the, at that point would be the fact that you use that key card at the specific time at the specific place mm -hmm. that's technically the evidence however if there's no cameras to corroborate who was the person entering then there's no way to really tell that it makes sense. not mm -hmm. in that makes a uh, that makes that makes a whole lot of sense yeah because it's not simply the fact that it was used it would need to have some other piece of information for it to be useful whether in a court of law or in a super sleuth experiment but then, okay, so what other, when it comes to entry, um, when it comes to entry is like, how, how do you, how do you approach the world of like, how do you approach the world that we live in then? How does that change your perspective as far as not necessarily vulnerabilities because it, you can, you can always find new ways to get through problems. Yeah. You know, I think I think most people, especially most people in gun culture, are extremely aware that the the majority of their security systems on their home, like the locks on your doors, the and the, like the locks on your doors and your security system in your home, is sort of a passive level of security that keeps a casual out of your home. But if someone were to like no shit do a raid on your home, like your 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 Walmart lock or no amount of lock is going to really stop it i mean it you could just shotgun or breach the explosive breach the door if it was that big so i, I kind of want to stay away from kind of i want to stay a little bit away from like the the little bit more casual level conversation of like everything out there is so porous but rather try to ask you about like you know what well then what is the what are these different what are, what is let's start with covert um let's, or let's see let's let's start with covert and be like how does that what does that look like as far as like tools and school skill sets and like observation and training and then how you get there okay cool um so i'll come at it from the context of just how our course where so we'll okay from like the 101 to 201 to advanced and even like other instructors in the space how they teach as well so typically speaking like a 101 which is like a one day eight, nine hour class on like the basics. Like, all right, so here is how locks work. Here is what the, here's like definition. Here is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Nomenclature for tools. Cause that's a, that's a big part of it too. Is nomenclature it equals like a shared understanding of what words and what things mean. Mm -hmm. So there's that and how to lock pick, how to, you know, different techniques. Um, and obviously people focus in on the, the lock picking portion because it's, well, we focus in on it on the first day because it's the hardest thing for people to learn and pick up. Mainly because a lot of the shit is subjective, mainly field based. And so getting people on the same page with something that isn't um, like super tangible. And I can be like, this is how you do this exact thing. This is what you're feeling for. I can't teach you what to feel for. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I can't feel for you. So 
um, it's pretty much getting everyone on that same exact page the first day. So they'll come out of there picking and raking open probably minimum 25 plus locks by, by, by the end of that day. Um, and then we go into bypassing, right? So bypassing by definition is getting past a lock obstacle without having to manipulate the pens. So if I want to go and do the credit card technique, right? Like I, I say the credit card technique, but the actual definition of it is loiting. So if I want to avoid a door, um, which loiting is essentially just a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a vulnerability where the door is, isn't hung correctly. So there's a little bit too much space between the door and the frame, or there's a mismatch between the, uh, the dead latch and the strike plate. And basically what happens is that the strike plate, the hole inside of it's too large so that the locking mechanism can actually do what it's supposed to do. So that's what we're taking advantage of. So if we use our, our little credit card technique, that's a bypass because mm -hmm. I'm directly inter interacting with the, uh, with the pins inside the lock. Um, some other ones could include using a uh, UDT or it's called under the door tool. So when there's a lot of there's excess space beneath the door and there is a lever style handle, I can reach underneath the door and pull down on the handle from the opposite side. So that's also a bypass. Mm -hmm. So we'll focus on those like in day one, kind of bleeding over into day two. Day two, we'll usually do a little bit of competition just to kind of get the blood rate up a little bit and see what they actually do under pressure. Um, from there, we go into even more in-depth bypass, hotel room bypasses, which my wife loves to teach. Um, we'll, we go into creation of tools. Creation of tools is something that's a little bit more unique to Cloaked Entry Co. And that's why we get a lot of service members as well, especially guys that, um, or even like, you know, we've had some feds in the class too, but guys that necessarily can't carry tools to the places that they tend to operate in. So it's like, all right, cool. If you can't carry this stuff in, here's the minimum you can carry. And this is how you make the stuff in the place that you're going to be in. So you don't get caught going to there with the things you don't want to be caught with. Mm -hmm. um, and then our day three, our advanced course is going to be really heavy on decision making. Um, ulterior or other methods, including destructive methods, while still keeping that covert. And that imply it requires lots of planning in that process in order to do something in understanding the context of the environment you're operating in. Um, so like if it's daytime, how much ambient noise is there in the place that you're operating in? Um, can I wear something that that way someone doesn't even bother questioning me because I'm supposed to be there? It, there could be a bunch of things that they now have to consider when using whatever tool that they plan on using, but they'll have a ton of stuff at their disposal and it won't just be like, I'm going to use lock picks. I'm going to use this. It's mm -hmm. like, all right, cool. You're going to get to this thing. You're going to realize you don't have enough space to actually get into, you know, to use that tool that you were planning on using. Now you have to use something else. Mm -hmm. Have you planned to do that? And that's what pros do. You're going to get the rehearsal time to do that. So that way you can gather your own data. And you can be like, all right, cool. Here is the highest probability of success to get into this specific scenario. Here is my list of things with the probabilities in tow. So it's like highest to lowest probability of it working. So that's pretty much what the advanced course is going to be. A lot of games, a lot of decision making, um, recon. So you understand your routes, um, what's going on during that day, and then being able to make the choice on what tools to, make, or to use for this specific entry. Mm -hmm. So it, it reminds me a little bit of, of what you would, and this is going to not, this is not meant to be derogatory. It reminds me a little bit of like what you see when you have a, a defensive pistol course mm -hmm. or a rifleman or, or whatever it is. Right. So like, you know, I was, I had, the, I had an opportunity to take up, <clears throat> attend a court, a, 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 a block of teaching that was run by a Ryan training group. And there's all, and, and this, this is not the first block of training I've been to, but I was, <laughs> thankfully opportunities have opened up a bit in the past and so one of the things though is that you see at the beginning of every course is there's always this introductory into the why and 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 and, is, and um a, a permit to carry course is always there's always that the teacher will always whether intentionally or unintentionally will 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 allow this element of why you a person would even do the thing to kind of come out and so um you know when it comes to so when it comes to even gun culture, one of the challenges that we're seeing 
and I think we'll always see. I think it's just a human challenge. I think I don't I don't think it's unique to gun culture, but since we're here, it's very much so in front of our faces. Is trying to figure out the why. Like, why am I training, or why am I developing this skill set, or why am I? What am I striving for? Or what's the objective here? And and at the same time, one of the things that the military or or maybe some sort of profession might provide, even if it's a false. Uh, if it's not really, um, it's, even if it's a false foundation, is it gives you at least a mission? Yep. And and a mission isn't like when I say when I think even think about it this way, like going on deployment and having a mission to get ready for it wasn't it? It was a short term, temporary um, relief from the burden of wondering what I was doing with my life. But it wasn't. It, but as soon as the mission was over, that 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 issue that that weight would come back on. And so just as I think veterans or people in the military can use specifically people in the military can use like a heavy deployment cycle or whatever the current mission is as a distraction from their, um, I wouldn't even maybe existential crisis. So people on the civilian side are much more faced with that, uh, but may use stuff and things and skill sets to try to like distract them from the question so how would you approach like the this idea of entry and and um understanding your environment and its vulnerabilities better from a why perspective like why not well not only why would somebody want to learn this is and they're going to have more skill sets but like why would you be interested in teaching something like that hmm. so for the why for the teaching it i usually like to break this down into uh so we call it framing here. So framing as in what you do in your everyday life. Some people, it might just be a job function and we can help you mm -hmm. in a function. One, to um, maintain the security of someone that you're saving. And then two, be saving your you know, your department or your, your agency some money on not having to destroy things constantly. Um, for me teaching it, I think that the ability to get into any place, if it's not any place, just about any place is you never know what that skill can come and use for. And that could be just getting into your fucking car because you locked yourself out. Could just be getting into your house because you locked yourself out. Um, but it's it's maintaining a certain level of capability of there is not an, a, a locked obstacle that I can't get by. So I think that's a power that fucking, I won't say everybody should have, but I think good people should have at the very least. I know we can go down the whole rabbit hole of what, who's good and who's bad, but um, just your everyday prepared citizen being able to get into a place if need be for emergency purposes or just for, you know, for whatever the case is. Yeah, no, that, that, that there is a certain element to it too. Cause yeah, like I, I've locked myself out of my car and I've yeah. locked myself out of my house and we figured out ways to get in. And there's a little bit of fun in going, Oh yeah, that's how I got into my own thing. Um, and there is, there is that, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's like cold comfort. It doesn't really stick to the soul very well but it's like well yeah but now you you don't have this false sense of security right you know um you don't have this false sense of security and and, and i think it's if anything there's something to be said there in the sense of when you own a gun you, it's not that everyone does this but there's a part of being owning a firearm that uh sort of forces you to ha become more aware of your responsibilities. You, I think that it's not in, it's not inherent, right? There's things like child soldiers and there's things like tyrannical governments and there's t things like foolish people and, and there's all these problems, but you know, there's, there is this um, generally speaking, healthy respect for, the capability of violence it generally yep. exists amongst those who are capable of it whereas mm -hmm. those who are not capable of violence generally don't have a respect for it or not our working knowledge of how that works like you know it's it's it, the easiest most classic example is oh you're in the military you were in special operations or you know you're you're the, I'll, I'll give it the way that it's given to me and then i'd give it the way that it, I'd, I'd expect it for maybe some things about you but like for me it's Oh, you were a ranger. You probably know ninety-seven ways to kill me, and it's like no one says that in a real-world scenario. <laughs> you know, no, like, no, like, like it's uh, like I'm not. This is not me. And this is not meant to be insulting. But like, tell me you have no idea what you're talking about by telling me you have no idea without telling me you have no idea what you're talking about. Like, not even the 
this i mean so and sometimes it's in good humor so like making yeah. exceptions and so when and i could think about it this way so you're a foreign weapons you've worked in foreign we-, or we could say foreign weapons experts like oh you probably know all you you probably know how to disassemble every gun in the world yeah that's, yeah you it's know. a gross like yeah that's not you know, I, I, I could, to be frank, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not actually sure what a special weapons expert or a foreign weapons expert would be, mm-hmm. you know, now that we're not exactly in the cold war. Yeah. And so to give a little bit <coughs> the foreign weapons, so my MOS, I'm going to love infantry dude. Um, been infantry for um, shit going on almost 10 years now. Um, but the course that we work at, is essentially for the SFABs, however. So so SFAC, so the Security Forces Assistance Command, technically owns this course, but we are housed under First Special Warfare Training Group, and therefore we also teach all manners of fucking SOF as well. So mm-hmm. IOPS, SF, MARSOC, SEALs, you name it. We've to, even, our, even Ranger Bat, we actually did uh, MTT with them, uh, Second Bat, not too long ago. I'd like to say about four months ago. Um, so we go to familiarize people with weapons that they could possibly be seeing in whatever area of operations that, um, and not just like the standard, like small arms, we do heavy weapons as well. So that's pretty much what the job is, is just picking guys that kind of know their shit and pushing them out to the force in order to get them more acclimated to the things that they're going to see on the ground. You know, show them how to, you know, just zero a weapon in a couple of different ways, especially if you have to work through a language barrier. Um, the, the whole the, the, that's pretty much what we all deal with. So, yeah, no, it, it makes sense. It, like, I uh, experience makes sense. I've been, or I have, you know, I, ha- I have even in, even in the, even in the long and short of it, like in my home, I have an AR 15 and I have an AK. Okay. <laughs> So the very simple fact of it's not that I me I'm not I wouldn't I would I wouldn't call myself like <coughs> I'm capable with an AK47 but I'm not not nearly even on the on, not nearly as capable with an AR outside of the the common fundamentals like trigger shoot you know like trigger aim sights this kind of stuff but when it came to like thing even the simplest thing like a magazine reload we're not on the same planet um but uh i'm not on the you know it's not even on the same you know ecosystem with the with with an ar style platform and so being able to i imagine there's something valuable in in data collection when it comes to looking at the the tools that you'd use so here i i guess can i and i know that i know that opsec is an important thing but i'm going to give in a scenario and i'm kind of curious on how you would address something like that I was in I was in London once. I've, I've, my wife and I have had an opportunity to travel a couple of times. I was in London, and if you've been to London, I don't know if it's still like that today because this was pre-COVID. But in certain parts of the city, you would find uh, ar- relatively armed police officers. This mm-hmm. they, they would have long guns of some sort or carbines of some sort, and not being a Londoner. Um, I didn't, I wasn't very, very keen on picking up the differences in uniform there. I, you could, if they're obvious, like very, very, very different, uh, blouses or tops or pants or hats or helmets, or like this guy's wearing a plate carrier and this guy's only wearing soft armor. Yeah. You could pick up on those, but like a little bit more of the subtleties, like, um, I wouldn't always pick up on the different patches. Uh, and, and, but one thing I noticed is it was not it was not uncommon at all and mind you like london is is kind of an important city in england and right. in london there's this kind of palacey thing where the royalty sometimes spends time so like it's not like they were just you know randomly walking around if you knew if you were in the right place of the subway you'd run into you'd find these uh, you know these these um police officers or if you're in the top tubes or whatever you want to call it like if <laughs> So it was it didn't they didn't feel like they were out of place for their armament but it was very 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 common for me to encounter to uh, not encounter but observe two or three police officers or what looked like police officers talking to each other in a group but one of them had a SIG MCX and one had an AR15 of some sort and one had an MP5 or something like that 
and it was ex- it, in that part confused me like it was almost like a bring your own well except for you're in europe so you d- you can't do that but it was like there's a certain weirdness to it like why aren't you uniform why do you have an mcx and you have an ar like that just doesn't make sense right and so how would you approach you know you're c- instead of looking at at being a foreign weapons expert and looking at a, a um, I think it was a, a Politicon, doesn't let you say this anymore, second world country. Uh, but if instead of looking at, um, you know, like a, a third world country or, or, a, or a Soviet-esque um, adversary, how would you look at something like that from like an, a weapons expert position? What does that information tell you about the environment? Um, so, I mean... If you know, I guess if you dra- if you travel quite a bit, I know for the police forces in a lot of European countries, they don't have everyone carry guns. So it's usually a very specific units that carry guns. And with that knowledge, that's kind of how I'm already kind of looking at it. And I'm like, if you're carrying different things, you guys are probably in really specific units with what you're carrying. But they're also operating in the same area at the same time. So that could allude to something else happening. Maybe there is some royalty that's present. Or something like that and they just wanted to bulk up and bolster security maybe that's the case um so that's pretty much it i don't really know many units that have ragtag fucking guns uh just kind of spread out especially in a place like london i wouldn't even consider i don't even know if i would consider london a second world country oh no i definitely wouldn't it's definitely it de- like the first second third world is is, is sort of a little irrelevant now because yeah it, it was always like if I if I can recall right, the term first, second, third world countries wasn't necessarily a relevant as relevant to their economic status as it was, you know, um, a, a de- democratic countries were first world, communist countries were third world, and whatever was in the middle, the op- was considered a second world country. That was a major. That was one level of influence, one data point that contributed to whether or not you were classified first, second, or third. And so, communists can read in the comment section. But uh, <clears throat> turns out being a communist makes you a third world country and history tends to repeat itself in that way. Big time. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's probably how I would I would look at it. If I'm seeing multiple different, especially something as drastic as some dudes are rocking subs versus some dudes are rocking high end fucking MCXs. I'm like, mm, OK, maybe something else is happening around this area right now that is requiring different units to work together, which that's what I would be pointing towards since this these are uniform um, you know, agencies or organizations. So their weapons should also be uniform. Yeah. And then all of us, us coming from, you know, like we're Americans and America decided to separate itself from Europe, but we do have our England. So we do, but we do have some commonality to it. And it, I think it's, it's interesting looking at how we approach scenarios based on familiarity, because um, I've also traveled to Africa in the past. And when in a city that we were in, in Northern Africa, we saw a similar event, but it was like same uniformed guys. You had dudes all in the same uniform, but one of them had, I'm pretty sure one had either. A, this, it was a couple of years ago, so I'm trying to remember. One of them was definitely carrying like an MP5. They were standing at a gate. So it wasn't like they were, they were standing at a gate. They were standing uniformed at a gate, one at each side of the door. But they had different weapons, and I found that strange. And it was like, it was something like one had an FAL and one had a G36, or one had an FAL and the other one had an MP5. Mm. And and this country isn't necess- isn't the most isn't like an impo- uh, isn't the most impoverished country, but it was a northern African country. It was in Morocco, beautiful place. You got to go to Morocco. It's amazing. Um, but it was but I so once again I saw the same thing. It was two people in uniform protecting a location that was most likely some form of palace some form of government building um different construction because we're not in london anymore we're in we're in africa it had the, the the kind of um the tall wall around the outside and so now i had to try to look at that differently because in london you have one it's it, you, you know there's one set of cultural aspects that would give me reason to think of it this way for example, more like I'm more likely to assume that it was different units working together in London, whereas in Morocco, I'm much less likely to make that assumption given the circumstances. Right. Um, 
So yeah, like what how, how, what is what are some other factors that come to the the reconnaissance and the investigation side of entry? Like how do you look at that? And I want to phrase it in one as one more example. I remember a couple of years ago, it was extremely trendy to talk about this is like 2014 15 time frame. It was extremely trendy to talk about situational awareness and it was almost oh, yeah. all it was almost always talked about in this weird kind of Jason Bourne esque I can point out some detail you can't point out kind of thing where the ego would flare every once in a while. And, and, and one very good example of it, though valid, was like even in retrospect a little bit like you could have said it's not that you, it, the delivery was weird. And so you can get over it. We're adults, right? But it yeah. was this, this idea of like, you know, people are so dumb. I was in, I was in public and I went to this restaurant and, and, and I didn't find any exits and there was like a bike lock sitting next to the front gate or the front door and i could have just bike locked everybody in and then it would have been like you know a horrible scenario and it's like okay yeah i mean tell tell me that you had needed you need you you don't have a mission without telling me you don't have a mission yeah um you see how i'm saying with that like you know yeah. it, it's 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 just i'm not saying that he didn't have a good point it's just saying like not really steep in reality I mean, it was very real. I wouldn't no, even say that. So while I'm not saying it's not a real thing, I guess I'm saying the probability of that being the case is pretty, pretty fucking low, I guess. Yeah, the probability of having a break and entry is also low in my house. And it doesn't mean that I don't carry a handgun. I think the issue that I took with it is, why are you telling me you're sociopathic? <laughs> oh, gee. Oh, man. Like, that's an inside thought, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Or that's a conversation you have like with a friend, like, you know, this is a little odd. Or this is like a conversation you have with like you talk to the manager and be like, Hey, this doesn't happen often, but you know, like I'm a security I'm kind of, I'm a security specialist and you have this you know, you got you can't be egotistical about it, but like I would recommend if you're gonna lock your door when you leave the business with a bike lock, when you open up in the morning, you take that bike lock and you bring it back into the manager's office because it could get stolen or it could be used for nefarious purposes. Yep. But it's not like, you know, and it's social media, man. People do this all the time. Oh, uh, yeah. It's actually really funny that you, you spoke about that in particular. Um, I'm, in, I'm on this group that me, that this guy created. He's a good friend of mine. Um, and he pretty much just made the group so that all, all the, the security specialists can go in one place and kind of just drop whatever they want to drop in there, right? So, like, some really good tips, tricks, uh, whatever they want to drop in there. Really good shit. And uh, a guy dropped some stuff in there yesterday about uh, pretty much a case study stating that criminals are always going to go for the easiest thing that they know how to do best. And exactly what kind of you explained, there's an easy fucking old ass master padlock that was on the, the, the closing doors um, on the front of the building. And the dude just took a brick and put it through the window. <laughs> so, And that's just uh, and that's it's pretty concurrent with what we see pretty normally. Right. Everyone thinks that. Like, um, the first thought when people learn how to gain entry to play is, oh, I need to change all my locks. Oh, I need to change this. Oh, I need to change about my house. And I'm like, no, calm down. Slow, slow the fuck down. Like, no, there's, there are no, there, there's no data to support that that is how people are getting into to your houses. That's usually not how it is. Lock picking is making up less than 2% of fucking breweries. So there's, that, there's not enough data to support that you need to change every lock on your fucking house right fucking now. And then on top of that, if you're going to do that, I was like, there's a bunch of other things you have to look forward to because brute force is probably the way that they're going to pick to get into your house in some form of fashion. So if you don't want them smashing your glass windows open, um, probably looking at some 3M breakaway film, um, change all the fucking screws in your fucking your uh, your strike plates so that they actually go into the frame of the house. Do they come out about an inch and a half, which is nothing that's not going to protect someone from booting your front door in. Um, then having like uh, the metal slider on the inside of your frame to waste energy if someone is trying to boot your door in. There's a, there's a bunch of things you can do to actually toughen the exterior of your house um, that will waste the time of the person trying to do it. And that's really what security is. Everyone thinks security is they absolutely keep everyone out. A determined attacker will eventually get in. It's really about being redundant in that in that security mindset so understanding that there's supposed to be layers to this shit and not just one security measure that if it fails they get in 
And that's mm -hmm. really what we have to talk about as far as security is concerned. Yeah, well, I've been playing Call of Duty, so I put a security turret in front of my front door. <laughs> straight to jail. Straight to, Just straight to jail. But, uh, uh, you know, what is the legality on punji pits? Straight to prison. Straight to fucking prison, dude. Yeah, <laughs> straight to prison. Uh, all right, so then, I mean, so, um, you know, for, for this, for a person, like, for this mindset, right? So this attitude, um, the, you have from from a ta from an attacker's opinion right so for you looking back in your life as you've learned to picked up more skill sets i i, I assume is, while you're working on one skill set because you can only learn so many things at a time at, there's always a period of time where everything looks like that like just like yeah. when you buy a car all you notice is that car when you're interested in buying that you see it all on the street when you start learning how to lock pick all of a sudden you're you're just paying attention to everybody's locks um, but from a, from a little bit more of like a, 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 a retrospective perspective, like you standing here going, okay, this is how I've started. This is how it's changed my observation of the environment, um, over time. How would you, how would you bring that up? How would I bring it up with someone else outside of the folds per se, or just in general? <laughs> In general, like how how do you, how is your opinion? How is your observation of let's just say America changed okay. um, as you've developed different skill sets and observed different things, and 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 as, perhaps a little bit as like as the uh, the 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 mysticism behind lock picking kind of evaporates, or you know the vulnerabilities are no longer as shocking. How how is your observation and of of like Western living changed? Um, I would say for, for Western living in general, like if we were like Japan where lockpicking crimes were on the rise for, I think it jumped up to like 10% or something like that for burglaries. It was super fucking high for a while. Um, America would be in fucking trouble. People would get in their houses robbed left and fucking right. Um, just because like, it's, it's always going to be lowest bidder for, for locking them. They, they really do keep honest people out. Um, not, but it's okay because criminals aren't keen on taking time to learn a skill set to help them be a better burglar so it was kind of nice in that fact because burglars are fucking lazy and they use the sweetest cheapest method to get in that is <laughs> such a good point that is such a like that is such a really 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 good point like you know um like criminals like 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 there is the difference between organized crime and casual crime but like most people who commit murder aren't like preparing their legal defense before they just blast you with a knockoff gat they ripped off the street yeah <laughs> oh yeah yeah so. no it's so true it's like why, oh sir you know why are you attending this class oh i want to participate in casual murder casual crime <laughs> yeah you know not it yeah um so yeah i would say that's that's the case for that i was like if there there were a class of criminal that were skillful and there are there's some out there but they're not hitting people's fucking houses um a class of criminal that started to do that stuff and burglarizing homes and stuff like that um that's a much smarter criminal one um because they are they also understand other things that go into it like we think because most people think because they're in the military they're the only ones that understand fucking recon it's like dude that's far fucking from it that's people so can, not true yeah yeah people conduct recon and don't even realize they fucking do it <laughs> but now you know criminals are very deliberate about their fucking recon too and it's small shit man people think that when they're when they're casing out a fucking house you know there's like oh that looks like a good house to break into i'm gonna break it down I'm like no brother that's not the way they're fucking casing your house the way they're casing your house is one is there a bunch of mail stacked up outside your house that looks like it hasn't been touched in a fucking while that's a good indicator that no one's been fucking home for quite some time so stopping your fucking mail from coming to your house while you're fucking on vacation probably good social media most people that get their houses robbed are getting robbed by people that they fucking know when they're telling everybody in the whole world that they're fucking going on vacation for two months on a fucking cruise ship. Um, and people are like, oh, well, I have cameras. I'm like, cameras are good passively for trying to catch someone after the act is committed, not during. <laughs> so I'm like, cameras are great, man. And it's they're definitely good for like sound the alarm, but it's not going to stop them that they're, they're already in your house. They're already robbing your shit. Like that's going to be for after after they're gone. And then you hopefully catch them after they fenced all your shit. <laughs> um, so 
I would say that's that's a pretty big one. And the other way I look at it is how how absolutely crazy the surveillance state is in in the United States. I don't think people realize just how many cameras are every fucking where. And a lot of these cameras can be piggybacked off of too. And that's something else people don't realize that all the cameras they have in their houses, outside their houses can be piggybacked from outside sources. Pretty fucking easy. Mm -hmm. Um, which is it this is the this is the the thing that I wanted to get into is is that so this is called the redacted culture cast one of the one of the primary motives behind the starting this one of the one of the core like ethos kind of uh concepts behind the company that really stood out when it was getting started was that you know there's this idea of privacy versus property right so you can own it you can own a firearm you know but if I know what firearm you have and I know where you have to keep it because I've used rules and edicts to do that, or, or because I have surveillance surveillance into your home. If I if you have cameras in your home, let, let's just let's go let's go full overt here, right? If okay. we're ad, if we're adversaries and we're doing some sort of mobster level, uh, what's that? Lucky number eleven, you know, two towers across the street kind of thing. <laughs> uh, if we're in that kind of scenario except for it's just you and me and i know I can, I can get access to your cameras i can i can straight splinter sell your cameras and i can look through your house and see where you store your gun i know and i i can know what you have i can know where you keep it i can know how you move to it and then i can build a plan to 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 defeat that problem right i can tyrannize you in that way whereas in in relation to like our our our, our country uh, this is, you know, the, the fictional story is over now. There's a certain level of difference between, there's a certain, I'm sorry, there's a certain series of principles that ha raise to question, I might, uh, how much, what part is more important when it comes to the citizen owning firearms? Is Is it not only that they have it, or is there a necessary element to privacy? If the state knows everything that you have at all times, and is capable of using that information at any given time to maybe determine your innocence or guilt, regardless of action, or 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 use possession as a form of intent. Then the you possessing that item doesn't really, it isn't really liberty. It isn't really you having an AR-15 in your home doesn't matter if the government can if the government is fully aware of who does and doesn't own a firearm. Because if they want to do a tyranny, then they already have the they already have the information, and you being in possession of that is no longer a deterrence against that form of tyranny. Whereas it's no longer the active pass simultaneously active passive defense against tyranny. Um, and uh, you know, so 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 when it comes to the surveillance state, uh, how does that change? How does like how do you look at this idea of the surveillance state? I look at it from a philosophical position. I see it as the government trying to act as God, um, trying to trying to build itself into a level of omniscience. It's a form of self-worship and, and it never ends well. A little bit yeah. tower tower of Babel, if you will. Yeah. Whereas you are approaching this from not only like a mechanical on the ground perspective, but like well, how would you how, how does the civilian, the citizen, maneuver in the surveillance state? Ah oh, man. Because this isn't Blade Runner, although I'm jelly. <laughs> maneuvering around surveillance is fucking dip man that, that's a really good question that's going to require some some thought we can we can we can tap into it later like i know it's, oh, i know no. we're going to be talking and then you know it's hard to have the ram building in the back of the noggin but um it's been a major question for me of like so i've seen a couple of um so i've seen stuff with uv light being able to kind of obscure faces while mm -hmm. you move there's some people have them like they'll have a pretty much like a, a half moon shaped fucking beam of uh, UV light that comes off of the hat mm -hmm. that up the face. I don't know how exactly how it works with your camera lens, but it essentially puts like a filter in front of your face that they can see through. Um, I've seen people paint their fucking faces in order for them not to be able to do the facial recognition scan on their faces. I've seen cool. I've seen a couple of ways to go about it, and obviously just wearing a. Fucking it too man that, that's another way you can fucking help out with it but it doesn't really matter when there's I'm, so many have to I'm, be. 
I guess I'm going to take a step back. When you mentioned the surveillance state, what are you talking about? What do you what 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 is the apparatus like? What do you mean? Because you're talking, we've already gone into like cameras and how to defeat different you know mechanisms. You have to identify the mechanism before you can defeat it. Like when yeah. you're when I think of surveillance state, I think I, I think of you know tracking on different levels. Whether mm-hmm. it's they're technically reading, they have the ability to read your emails at any given moment. There is no longer the private. It's not necessarily that somebody's listening to my phone call at all given hours. It's that there's the potentiality of somebody listening to my phone call. Gotcha. Without redress of grievances, right? Oh, so that's so uh, you mean you mean total surveillance? Then you're not just talking about just cameras. Gotcha. I'm just trying to I'm trying to figure out how you, when you say the word surveillance and surveillance state, like passive active surveillance, how do you describe that? So, uh, sorry about that. Just got a fucking text from my buddy. Oh, okay. But- I thought you were reading. I think I have a book on my shelf called Security <laughs> Studies. <laughs> So uh, I picked this up at some shop somewhere. It's just an, it was another one for like information reading. And so if we're, if we're being completely honest right now, as far as secure, like security, you know, you're, the active passive surveillance state that we've been talking about, it's, I don't want to say it's possible to kind of skirt around it, but it's pretty close to, mm-hmm. um, mainly because people aren't even aware of like their digital exhaust. Like we put so much and I got digital exhaust from this. Uh, she's on Instagram. Uh, that one hot Intel chick. I've talked to her 18 otter and we've kind of been chat talking. Um, but digital exhaust. So the amount of information you place on the internet at any point in time, dating back to whenever the fuck is always, always available. Right. So finding ways to kind of dial back on that is really fucking difficult, especially when you're buying shit, you know, through online through like, you're always going to have some type of bread trail or bread breadcrumb trail or something leading to what you're doing. Right. Um, funny story about a guy that just got hemmed up for murdering his wife. He put a bunch of questions on Google that pretty much damn near had him dead to rights when he actually made it to court. Um, he was looking up like how long it takes to a body for, for a body to do. How can I, what's the best tool to chop up a body with and stuff. He's putting all this shit into Google and in no shit, they bring all that shit up in court. And I'm just like, man, if they can do this, that's one situation. Um, we saw all the attacks happening with the uh, substations, right? The Washington group that had just gotten hemmed up about it. And I told people, all the time. And I'm like, if you're the going Washington to- state, not the DC area. Yeah. Okay. Um, I tell people all the time, I'm like, if you're going to do some shit, sometimes you got to go straight up fucking analog. And I'm like, understand like your offset is going to matter. You know, you you know all about offset infills. It's, it's fucking necessary. Mm-hmm. Even if you're going to do some crazy shit, you might need to offset pretty fucking far off because one, you're always being tracked. You have to be aware of all cameras that are tracking you. Your fucking car has GPS in it. So, like, they can always ping your ass at that location. So, you have to, like, go straight, like, on foot and know your, know your routes and all that shit if you're going to do some crazy shit like that um, in order to not get caught. And what happens? The guy doesn't use his phone, so that's great. Uh, but the only problem is he uses a burner and activates the burner inside of his house after he turns off his cell phone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we also see – we also – I mean, that we. it's not that – this is kind of where I'm trying to. Fo- I want to focus on this one. Is is it's a little bit of like remo- pulling back the veil of mysticism on this subject. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by mysticism is like so. In the there's this is I'm gonna go, go back into philosophy again and religion and theological arguments. Is that like mysticism and occultism and uh, gnosticism are all similar words that are used in theology and philosophy to refer to um, a form of belief that involves secret wisdom and secret knowledge and secrets kind of thing. Right. And yeah. so the, 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 this idea the allure of the dark arts or Gnosticism, the word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word Gnosis, which was the prominent word at the time when Jesus was alive on the earth. And it's this, it just, it all, it all kind of comes together. When you look at the history of the stuff, it makes sense. But the primary element, the primary, both religious and, and, um, theological or metaphysical argument that was being made was that by performing special rituals people could obtain certain wisdom like yeah. certain certain secret knowledge of like you know have manipulations the idea of the spells and stuff like that so mysticism is much more akin to 
something being uh, a kind of paranormal in that sense of not paranormal in the sense of it being like other than just, you know, pseudo normal, like normative, but more like, well, no closer to normative than normal, I guess. Normative being law like law, like meaning it's mechanical. Gravity is normative in that sense. And so it's <clears throat> it's this sort of argument. And so like when you look about surveillance and, and, and an example of mysticism in government. Uh, in citizen approach to government would be like looking at them as if they were if the government was con constituted of something other than people, whether mm -hmm. it's like Alex Jones, little, little lizard men side to like, which I know is a meme, but, or the other side, which is like um, looking at people as being other than human, as in they're more capable or beyond something. And that, so like, uh, another example of like mysticism would go back to like the Jason Bourne, you know, situational awareness thing where he's like, there's a bent white hair on your shoulder. You must have been in London three weeks ago, robbing a bank in Idaho. Why? With a potato made out of shotgun shells. And you're like, what the, you can, you know, like you know, this sort of like mm, attitude. Um, it's magic, right? It's this, this yeah. idea of like the magic, like, Oh, I can't explain it, but I know how I can make it happen. It's it's being able to like make the the lever work without knowing how it does, and so the car and the GPS and the, I want to move a little bit of the mysticism away from like surveillance and, and so go on, you know. In uh, one we've seen this happen now in the sense of like the era that we live in. Your phone, yeah, sure. If I set up my burner phone and I turn on my burner phone right next to my non-burner phone. <laughs> you for you and i or for you that's funny for for i i remember when i first learned that and i was like why does that matter I, this is a while ago you know and it's like well there are there the towers pinging them at the same place and you're like hmm these are at least affiliated it's a breadcrumb trail mm -hmm. how um how would you approach that because I don't, I don't, I, I want to focus, I want to try to approach it passively and actively. Like actively is like, I have to go do something. I'm not saying something illegal, but I have to go do something like it's, you know, and I, I, I think, I think when people are, are thinking of the surveillance state, they are actually more, I think even in my opinion, even in my life, if I have any sort of relevance to the rest of the world, I think the biggest thing that I'm concerned about is being hemmed up for something that is either innocuous or or generally legal, but misconstrued as being something else, mm. right? And so th there's right now there's a lot of people talking about the January sixth thing about whether or not the people were let in and they stayed in the rules and this that's the political conversation. That's right. one example of it, right? Is like well, it, like for for many of the people there, it wasn't like the 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 immorality legality question of it is strange. A much more close to home question would be like if i uh if i if i get pulled over for whatever reason or if i'm in a situation for whatever reason where i have an interaction with a police officer and they discover that i have lock picks in my in my pocket or my bag is that going to be construed as a t as intent or you know is, is there a certain is is my google search because i'm trying to figure out how to do something in splinter cell or some video game going to be misconstrued as being um attempting to rob a bank you know right hmm. not, it's probably not a good question yeah i'm trying to figure out how to how to actually frame this question <clears throat> on our question they answer hmm do you mind if we pass on this right now and we come back to it? We probably will have to because there's no, I don't, I, I, as the more I think about it, there's more like there's no way that we might be able to even breach this in a two hour conversation. Yeah. Probably because it doesn't, it, maybe the answer is it doesn't have enough data points to be a, uh, a mali, a, a workable question yet. And that's, that's useful. Like, will I get in trouble for owning lock picks? Well, are you picking locks in people's houses? No, then probably not. Right. Yeah. And I got, I have, I, I do have data on, on that stuff. Like that's the flaws for carrying lock picking tools are pretty straightforward for the most part um, in the U.S. So if you're mm. Tennessee is the only state that you can possibly get hemmed up and the, and the rules are a little bit in, uh, ambiguous. So 
but I'd say that's probably where you have the highest probability of getting in trouble just for having my person. Everywhere else is pretty pretty clear, mm-hmm. uh, clear and cut with you have to show intent or pretty much be caught in the act of doing uh, of burglarizing. So burglarizing. Yeah. The hamburglar. The fucking hamburger with lock picks. Yes. <laughs> Would they be made out of celery sticks? Yeah, probably, man. I don't know because if they work. You don't you don't you don't you do not put celery on. <laughs> I'm telling you, you do not put celery on a burger. I figured that one out before. But celery salt. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you stick. Yeah, I, I, you know, culinary things mean something to me. Oh, cool. uh, culinary snob. I, uh, I come from a family of of foodies, so ah. so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the cooking. So then let's, uh, let's kind of rotate gears a little bit. Uh, we've talked a little, quite a bit about the, we've talked quite a little bit, quite a bit about, um, you know, covert entry versus surreptitious entry. Um, or we started, we, we, we spend a lot on, on, I'm sorry. We spent, we spend a lot on, on, on covert. How would you, what are like, how would you, um, how would you coach somebody through a mind, the mindset of surreptitious of not leaving a breadcrumb, not leave, yeah. whether it's digital or physical, digital or physical. All right. So if for physical, there's a couple ways you can do, uh, the physical part. Once again, you can always check for anything that's open that's like the easiest thing to fucking do is like all right cool what's i'm gonna do a quick work walk around the building you can do this during the daytime too as Mm -hmm. long as you aren't being weird about it right understand what the baseline is of the of the area that you're in Uh, most businesses and places are like you can be there there's nothing wrong with you being there it's you'd be surprised at how people act when they know they're not supposed to be there but Mm -hmm. no one else (laughs) so if i walk into a throughout the day or wherever I'm going throughout the day, like no one's going to, everyone's going to be like, Oh, can I help you out? And you're like, Oh yeah. Like you have to have something kind of in your mind of what you want to do. That gives you the ability to kind of move around without raising suspicion. Moments you raise suspicion. Now you have to a little bit more to contend with, Mm -hmm. but in general, like be sociable, be, you know, smile, fucking walk around, fucking talk to people. And at the same time, collect the information you're looking for. So yeah. Um, it's it's con- I, I, it's convenient that I ha- I I'm I, I still look a little bit younger because I can I I can very difficultly pull off the oh I work for an architecture firm or I'm an architecture student trying to figure out what the building looks like or oh, oh, yeah oh, you know. could literally anything dude you could be the elevator tech you could be you could be literally anything you know obviously you have to do a little bit of due diligence so you don't get fucking wrapped up um, <laughs> with, with two simple questions <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, but in general, you can just walk, you can walk around, you know, take notes. You can do a close range, far range. If there are smokers that inhabit the building and they have a tendency to open the back door open to smoke mm-hmm. or stuff like that. And so you go around or maybe there's a, a, a keypad at the back with that's super fucking worn out and you can see which keys you have to push. Mm-hmm. Um, so stuff like that is super easy as far as like pulling that information and then seeing if you don't even have to fucking touch anything in order to get inside. Um, or you can do the slightly more drawn out method, which is uh, key generation, right? So I'm sure you've seen the cool stuff on uh, on movies where they, they get a picture of the key and then they recreate it, doing their doing their methods and shit. Um, and I'm like, is that doable? Yes, way harder than it fucking looks <laughs> to get like a good, crisp, clean, contrasted photo so you can grab bidding off of a fucking key. I've worked with uh, my wife's a photographer, and so by secondhand nature, I engage with photography. And yes, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> clarity's on the thumb, not on the key. Oh, well, yeah, we're yeah. not we're not getting what we need out of this one. So, uh, my buddy Pat, he runs a, he runs courses very similar to, to ours as well, and I attended his uh, his advanced operations course for. For key generation and some other stuff so that's actually where i learned it from and basically that was one of the exercises was to like try and get a key on a target that's moving right so we know this target's going to be at this place at this time and we try and grab a, a photo mm-hmm. right and while we're, we're we, you know we're we're being weird you don't even realize like how different you're being because you're mission focused versus just like blending into the, the environment you don't realize how intense you actually get and it throws people the fuck off. Like people can fucking feel that shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, and even grabbing the photo was it was blurry at best, right? Because the, 
it has to have like the right contrast. So let's say like a really dark key and a really light background for you to really be able to see that crisp, clean outline of, of the bit. So it's like, ugh, okay. So we get the, we get the picture, we end up working it out. And then there's other ways you can do it too, by you can use a, a what's called a leashy. Um, let me see. I should have. Uh, I've heard about these and I've seen them and I want to get my hands on one. Yeah. I, I mean, dude, uh, I mean, I'll have two of these KW ones. I might be able to just fucking, I might, send, I might be able to send you one. I'm, I'm here to talk. I'm here to have you on the show and have you add, add, you know, <laughs> add knowledge, not send me stuff. <laughs> yeah. But fucking, so essentially what it is, it's a two in one decoder. I don't know mm-hmm. if you video after this, but uh, it's a two in one decoder. Uh, essentially you open this up. This is your pick and this is your decoder at the same exact time. Interesting. So, the pros is it takes some of the guesswork out of picking because mm-hmm. I'm trying to get this close to the camera. So it has a board here and a diagram. So on, okay. the, on the top row of numbers and the lines that cord those top rows, that's for your pins. So that's the first pin, second pin, third pin, to all the way to the fifth. So it takes the guesswork out of having to guess where each pin is in the stack. Mm-hmm. And then the second row on the side here is going to correspond to your uh your bidding depths okay mm-hmm. so it usually have value from one to five one to six or if you're like a, have a schlag that or a best that has six seven um pins it might have up to eight bidding values right so basically what i do is i would pick the lock after it is picked i can now read the bidding uh, actually, here, I actually might be able to do it for you right here, actually. So, mm-hmm. in a second, I'm going to pick this lock. And, actually, I might be able to even turn the camera. Have you? Uh, how do I turn the camera on this? I don't. Ooh, 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 there you go. Oh, it did. Or, I don't know if I can do that. But here, I'm, I'll just do it right here. Let's see how this works out. <laughs> yeah, let's. It's, 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 there you go. You're in frame. <clears throat> All right. So, I'm going to do... I'm just gonna rake this open real quick. And this will be this th- this is this is like a not so subtle hint that we do have a YouTube channel. Oh fucking sweet. <laughs> I just it's it we've been um uh, quite a few people who are, li- are quite a few of, uh, of those I know like who who interact with me. They say most of them listen, and which is great because I there's definitely a big distinction between me being able to watch a, a video on YouTube and like I even the idea of watching a two hour video on YouTube is like, uh, I usually just actually set my phone down and listen to it. And then when someone starts talking about doing the thing, I'm like, Oh, okay. I'll look at it. And then I put it back down. Um, All right. So it should be about there. Uh, let's see. All right. So here, so we're open up right now. Mm-hmm. All right. So let me get my, I have my leashy right here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to place it on the inside. All right. So now, as I pop this open, mm-hmm. I get my bidding depth. I'm going to go to the first first pin. And then where it drops is going to be my bidding value. So this is a one cut, right? So that's a one cut. And I go to pin two and let it drop. I can't really see what that is. I think it's a four cut. Mm-hmm. But basically, I can do that all the way across the board. So when you're looking at a key, uh, let's see. If I I am trying to see if I let's see if I have a key in here that is not affiliated to my home or garage or something. No, I don't have any keys in the house or in this part of the house. It doesn't matter when you're looking at a key. So like, um, uh, let's take. Uh, <clears throat> let's go. I got yeah. Out. Okay. Yeah. Let's take guns for example. Like you look at the history of guns, and and I'd love to have like Ian from Forgotten Weapons on here to talk more about this. But the there was a time before manufacturing where a gunsmith was like, oh, th- that's a that's that's made by Sir Reginald of you know Buttersby or whatever, or that's a uh, this is before the, the the interchangeability of parts, and so you'd have gunsmiths, and and, they, and so. Um, you know, like each one would have to be hand fit and hand built. And then eventually we got into the manufacturing, uh, the, the, the machining and manufacturing of handguns, ergo, like the Colt revolver, where you could break apart, replace it or assemble them collectively. Um, so, so I could imagine before in the industrial revolution, when it came to locks, um, 
there was a the keys were much much less standardized but you're now going through and i guess i i'm i'm trying to think of this from from two different angles one i'm sitting here going so because le locks are much more standardized you're saying oh it's got a depth of one it's got a depth of four it's a combination of saying there's sort of a standard range of depths that pins have but even then if i'm going so far as to make them then it then then the standardization doesn't matter like i don't need to be able to measure it to tell it you i don't it doesn't need to be that it's a, a one according to the smith and lock book seven of buttersby's lock you know i don't know why i'm on the buttersby's thing yeah, yeah you know what i mean but it's like i know how i know what i would consider a one is and so then i can put it to my jig and cut out a one yeah okay yeah so we'll have uh what we call spacing and depth keys so space mm -hmm. That's matters the depth of your cut matters so basically i just it's essentially another key but it's only that bidding across so like if it's a one cut it'll all be all one cuts across the key uh, cut, two. so basically i put them side to side i get a pair of clippers and then i clip it in that mm. base and so then once i have that i can go ahead and now i have their key and i can continuously use that key to gain and treat whatever the fuck i want mm -hmm. and now I'm like a weirdo doing it Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now I'm not sitting here trying to pick lots in front of the fucking door or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I open up the fucking door and have repeated use to that facility. Yeah. I mean, you can put on a key, you can put on a key ring, you put that key ring in your pocket. Then you have, you know, when people see you walking around, they see the, the or that you put it on a ring that is on your belt loop. So as you're walking around, there's that jingle jangle and people are like, Oh, he's got the keys. So he's probably normal. You can, you can really like it, being able to settle your nerves goes a very long way when it comes into that kind of movement. Just from my experience, yeah, of like you know having something, having having um having a token, like uh like what's the movie um totem? Sorry, having a totem, something like uh, out of a uh, token totem. What's the movie um Inception? Having something of like, oh yeah, blip, here's my totem, or here's my actually, I actually think token token might be a little bit more of like something that people remember, but they don't remember you. They remember the thing, you know, right. like you know, like oh, I, you know, I've got a, like a, you know, a caution, you know, wet floor thing because I'm gonna mop the floor, and you're like, okay, you know, right. something that makes you blend in is noticeable but not recognizable. Yes. So that would be a way to, for, for surreptitious, right? So again, mm -hmm. that's through a means that won't leave any, you know, any excess evidence because I don't have to leave the baseline. To get. So if I can just get in through the front door using a code, great. I know I, ha I can now, granted, there might be a log of my, of my logging in, but there's no camera footage of my, of me getting into the building. So mm -hmm. technically be surreptitious because they have no idea who came and who left. Um, on the digital side, so the flipper has a feature that has been out there for a really long time. Proxmarks use these same exact things where you snatch uh, key credentials, right? So 124 uh, megabyte cards or uh, RFID cards that use like Mefair um, and some other programs to write. You can essentially get close enough to the card and strip the credentials of it. So of, of, the, of the person who it belongs to, right? So... I should might be able to do that right now as well. I have a wallet on me. Yeah. So, so I let, let's let's break into the let's break into the um the I don't have it on me. It's probably on the other side of the the the, the office. To be honest. Yeah, it is. But the uh, the flipper itself is a really good example of like okay, um, out of the box, what can it do? And then what are can it is it is there like an unlocking process? Because I'm just the casual here. Like I I I've tried to I've cloned a couple things, and I've it, I've been using it as much a, as a learning tool. Yeah, uh, and also because like I enjoy I, I played this video game called Cyberpunk 2077. I was like, oh, this would be cool. I could try to figure out how to do that. You know, <laughs> it's just like it, it's it's it, sometimes it's it's as it's, it's simple as like. Huh, that's an interesting idea. And so uh, we moved into a house. I wanted to start thinking about ways to open my garage door and look for, for um, even looking at my own house, look for weaknesses. Mm -hmm. That's uh, 
So out of the box, I believe that you can read the signal that your car, your key fob comes and uses every time it locks and locks a car door. Um, that yeah. may because of the cipher that that cars use nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, what else? I'm pretty sure you can read credentials with the RFID reader. You can mm -hmm. definitely. And then you can re-emulate it or write it to a new card. Okay. And honestly, I think that's where you that's where you really make the most money, but you can also turn it into like a rubber or a bad USB. So essentially mm -hmm. you can to a computer and you can input um a, a type of malicious code or something like that. It could be anything. Mm -hmm. I'm not super spun up on using like the the rubber ducky or the bad USB stuff yet. Um neither I, am I. Yeah, I've kind of drawn away from it, honestly. Uh people think this stuff is like fucking magic. And I'm like, it doesn't make you a hacker by any means. <laughs> it's like, if you can't troubleshoot on why it didn't work, you're not a hacker. Um, and then you can like clone like remotes and stuff like that. So if you want to like use it for your TV and shit, you can do that. Oh yeah. The, the, the most I use my flipper for is when I'm having TV eye brain issues when I'm out in public and we're at like a restaurant and like the flashing lights, not like I'm going to like, you know, have a seizure or anything. But like when we're at a restaurant and I can't, I can't have a, hold a conversation with my wife because there's this television just like blaring noise off to the side. I'll just turn it off and then we'll go back to having our conversation. I, I do it. I, I don't do it all the time. And and there's cert, there's a certain amount of it like, oh, I can do this now. I have this power. Okay, I'm I'm listening to you, honey. Click, turn it off, because <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just. But it is it's it is one of those pet peeves. Like I don't like going to a restaurant where it's just like sports bar level televisions everywhere because you're just yeah. losing your mind. And so I'll, I'll, if if I'm sitting across from somebody, I'll try to turn the TV off above them so that I can actually have the conversation. Right. Oh, that's freaking hilarious by the way <laughs> it's 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 not for anything interesting it's not because i want to mess with the staff it's that like i'm, I'm trying to talk to you not right. get constantly distracted by this stupid television above your head blaring <laughs> some sports ball game i do not care about yeah uh, i know i don't fucking i don't do sports like what would you do with your time like literally run up everything fucking else dude i don't know mm -hmm. but yeah um so, like I said, the the flipper comes with some really cool features. Mm -hmm. but once again, don't think it makes you a hacker. Um, but if someone does happen to leave like a card, like you know, not looking after their credentials or whatever, yeah, you can one hundred percent steal those things. Mm -hmm. and pretty quick. So, but there's mm -hmm. like again, the, this that feature isn't new to the market. There are like no less than five or six machines that can do the exact same thing, mm -hmm. which read and write credentials. So, but they condensed it into a portable. Yeah, playable, you know, and you can do it too. Like, don't you can have a dude literally read credentials like in like a van or something like that while you steal it on yourself on the inside. Mm -hmm. So, like, there's if you look up like like pen testers, red teamers, they do stuff like that all the fucking time. There's a slight difference between pen testers and red teamers, but um, what's the difference? So, your pen testers, so penetration testers are guys that are paid by companies to essentially assess certain parts of their security, right? They'll do a, essentially an audit, but they won't know that the audit's going on. So they'll find ways to pretty much break in or you'll get into something or test something really specific as according to their contract with the person that hired them. Um, a red teamer is completely different. Their job and scope is much larger. They are paid to be an actual adversary, no holds bar, um, act, act and think as the enemy would if they were going after this company. That's essentially mm -hmm. what it is. Okay. So, so a pen tester is, it's not, so generally speaking in the professional world, a penetration tester is somebody who's paid to assess a certain mechanical system. Whereas a, uh, a red teamer is, is, is a little bit more, uh, a big picture, like whole company yeah. level, uh, Okay, because we it's not as simple as like okay, so I'm a pen tester, so I'm going to test all your locks, uh, and your and your digital passwords and stuff like that. It's more like uh, a red teamer is going to go to the level of like infiltrating. It could go through the go to the level of like infiltration through like HR programs through yeah. like, um, yeah, I could see that working. I could see that distinction yeah. being a little bit a, a little bit broader. Whereas one it, one is one is contained to a limited set of systems whereas the other one is much much broader right sure, and they, sure. 
they can actually inflict real time damage to the company. Oh. So, right? However, like, discussed in in their contracting, sure. Mm -hmm. But hey, like we're paying you guys to be an adversary, so you're going to adversary things. You have to destroy things, or you have to hack a computer and make mm -hmm. it not like mm -hmm. that's a thing they can possibly do as long as it's worked out. I know their contracting is huge because that could be the difference between you getting locked up or not. Because they have essentially like cover stories for who they are, mm -hmm. and if you get caught or something like that, they can give what's known as a, what do they call it? A get out of jail free card. So essentially, it's like. um it's signed from like their CSO or like mm -hmm. the chief security officer or the um, let's just say the CEO of the company stating like, Hey, the, this is who these guys are. They're allowed to be here doing this thing. Mm -hmm. so Given the event that you're caught by like security or cops or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with your, your, I imagine red teamers have the exact same thing some type of get out of jail free card, but these guys are like actively looking to inflict damage because that's, the, that's the point of them being Mm -hmm. which i i am i i like as it which is a difficult and tricky situation but that's you know like it's for a business to figure out how to navigate in the sense of red teaming their own public their own their own their own uh their own operation i mean you know i'm sure it, i don't think it'd be a really good movie plot if uh your red team the, the 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 conclusion of the movie was that they were a red team they were hired to be a red team but we just threw them in jail and got rid of them like Dude, I, it, it, I think it's happened. Um, so if you ever look up uh, a show called Dark Net, Dark Net Diaries, great I show. Um, they talk about pen testers, red teamers, and they give their stories like all the time. And some dudes have actually been caught, like, like, like we broke into, like, they broke into like, a, but the people they, they broke, break, they broke into a what? You cut out for a second. Uh, a courthouse. Okay. So they like broke into a courthouse and. Essentially, the people that contracted them didn't have any power over the courthouse. So when they got arrested, there was nothing. They, there's nothing that they could do to be like, hey, here's my get out of jail free card. And the cops are like, it doesn't fucking matter. The people that contract you don't own this. So, oh, yeah, that's a that's a tricky situation. Yeah. Oh, dude. Like, oh, man. and. You know, and I'm sure that happens more often than not. If like when you have I'm sure that happens more often than not. It, it's almost. um. It's almost like a lock stock and two smoking barrels. Like this is my target building, but in the process of going to do going to hit this building, I end up getting rolled up by that random dude over there. And you're like, Oh man, you know, like you're going, you're, you're so focused on be the target package or whatever, whatever your folk, you know, you're so focused on your, your target that you just like, yeah, we're actually putting you in prison for red for, uh, for, for, or, or not putting you in prison. We're rolling you up for like trespassing. Yeah, yeah. There's also like that. There's like isn't there's like there. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but like Timothy McVeigh was originally um, pulled over and brought to the jail cell. He was originally like apprehended for like not having a license plate or something like yeah. that. It was something completely innocuous. <laughs> and 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 then and then like and I I could imagine going from. Oh well, we got this like random dude who just like didn't have a license plate or something. To like, wait, he he just the the but the, but you know these two things are connected. And you imagine the guy and the guy who's like, you know, we just got this bum in the jail cell, and then like the FBI rolling in, like, oh my god, this guy's like the uncle. So, you know, everyone's watching yeah. the news, and although it's different because they didn't have cell phones back then, the same way, right? <laughs> but. Probably. uh you know, and that is like that is an interesting state. I wanted to I wanted to make sure that we we've been kind of trying to roll that way. We started with a very much so a very physical approach to the subject, and then we've been rolling into a bit more of like the digital, the cyber, the meta not metaphorical or metaphysical, but like the sort of like different way that things work. Um, I wanted to focus. I wanted to kind of I wanted to do a little bit of a harder shift when it came to a segue, and that be you know let's talk about um you know, like how is your how does your perspective on being a a citizen of the united states change when you look at how very easy it is to 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 say sort of break into the average citizen's home or how vulnerable we are or how fragile the piece is or maybe 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 the piece of the united states is not dependent on so much the strength of our locks but our our goodwill towards each other and how does that all 
like how does it, how does this how does this change your perspective in like your your what you're responsible for and who on you on the daily life level mm, what i'm responsible for <laughs> um so you might not like this answer i don't really think there's i don't necessarily see myself as being like responsible per se for mm -hmm. like citizen or uh, I, I I like the fact that I can do this stuff, but I can, can I say I bear any responsibility towards it? And, and I could be I could be very wrong. I'm always open to that possibility. Um, but I don't really. I mean, I, I put the stuff out there to let people know, like, all right, cool. I know it looks like this, but it very seldomly actually is this thing. So like, oh man, they can break into my house for X, Y, and Z. I'm like, that's not how it's happening. So like, listen to what I'm telling you. Like, mm -hmm. that this is how you prepare for that thing. Like the, what you're preparing for is the 2% of, of the time. Like that's, I won't say it's a waste, but pretty fucking close to it. Um, <sighs> I'll, use, I'll, I'll ask a story then. Like I know a guy, I know, I know a man whose house was broken into. Mm -hmm. um, and his house was broken into and they stole a bunch of, a bunch of his property. And, and, and it had, it had a greater effect on the family than just loss of materials. There was no one was no 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 one was home when it happened, but um, let's just say it was a it was a leading element in a compounding tragedy that is still like it. There's no way to say it gently. There's no way to put it. I don't. I, I can't talk about like doxing people or anything like that. But there was. It led. To, it led. To, it it it, ha, it part. It, it it led to a loss of life in the family because of so, sort of a loss of sense of home and 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 like like vulnerability there's more to it there's so many things going on here but right uh but when the, the the from from what i understand about the break in is that um it was very quick it was it was very quick it was when everyone was at work they <laughs> they they you know they popped the garage door cuz it's not hard to do yep if you know how to do it they popped the garage door kicked in the garage the, the door between the garage and the house which was unlocked <laughs> crazy they kicked the door down without even chesting the handle. Uh, and then they were in and out of the house relatively quickly, um, taking a, a, a mixed series of valuables. Um, and, and that led to a, a psychological effect and, 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 and like an, it, it had an effect on, on the family that lived there. Um, where they no longer felt safe and it was a safe neighborhood. It wasn't, it wasn't particularly known for anything and didn't have any whatever, but the people who broke into their house knew when they were going to be home, knew when they weren't going to be home, knew what they were going for. They didn't necessarily know exactly the items. There's no way to determine that, but they, it, this was a professional crew, right? Um, so they're not, so would you put them in the average percent that the 98 or in the 2%? I would put them, I'd say in the two, I, I, okay, I'm going to say that it depends on where they're at. I have heard, I won't say rumors, but I've heard from some buddies in the space that in certain spaces, it's starting to become a little bit more like, like not at like an alarming rate, but it's definitely an uptick than mm -hmm. there before. So what I, yeah. I, if they were probably part of the 2% for sure for that one, for like a seasoned crew that mm -hmm. did diligence that knew their ins and outs that knew when they'd be out of the house out of the house mm -hmm. and they were fast it sounds like they were fucking fast yeah uh, i mean there's no i don't think they have a they don't have like a i don't remember anything but in in realism they couldn't have been they they literally ripped a safe open like they cracked a safe it wasn't yeah. like uh it wasn't like a massive liberty safe but they brought tools to rip open the safe or, or there were tools found on property that were uh, made them allowed them to do that. Right. So, but it was definitely, it was definitely quick. It's not like there's a dude sitting there with a power drill, like, you know, with a, the, the stethoscope on the, the safe going, choo, 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 choo. it was like, they knew what they were going for. They came in, they ripped everything out that everything that they went for, they knew exactly. They, they had general ideas of where to go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a pretty solid SSE. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you don't know say. I would say this because people also got to realize that criminals are ahead of the fucking curve. They're always going to be. They have to be because if they're behind the curb, they're in the prison cell. Exactly. So, what's the what was the phrase they they said uh, back during? I think it was like the back during the invasion. Uh, 
all the all the fat and stupid people die first and then everyone that's left after that are the guys you got to worry about yeah. <laughs> eventually so like the guys that are out here that are seasoned that are that are quick movers that know the tools they fucking need um those are the guys that you need to worry about but those are definitely the two percent if, if they become more like the 30 percent, we got a fucking problem oh yeah yeah <laughs> real fucking problem if that's the case um which means we have to be a lot more diligent in the information that allow out and that's pat that's actively and passively right so actively by putting our shit online by showing having our houses stuff like that and then mm -hmm. the stuff you don't realize that you're giving out by without knowing you're giving it out so taking the same routes home every day if you're being fucking followed and stuff like that like that's that's information you're kind of giving out passively because you, you you're not aware that you're giving it out mm -hmm. um, so i would say if that starts to jump and that ends up being like at 10 percent or above we do have a fucking problem and like there's uh, clearly not enough people are getting fucking shot or killed or and i would even say you got to get to know your neighbors and shit too man i, mm -hmm. I that, people don't realize like the big one of the largest things you can do to keep your neighborhood safe is for everyone to be involved and understand when someone that isn't a part of your neighborhood is in your neighborhood mm -hmm. and that's probably one of the best like anti-theft devices you can have is a nosy fucking neighbor <laughs> yeah i mean where we moved to we're very thank i'm thankful even though you know i'm thankful for our, one of our neighbors who does have a sense of like he's he's a retired gentleman so he's got time and so for him it's like he'll send he's 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 not he's nosy enough where you're like it's you can think about it but he's not so nosy that i'm like worried that he's watching in my window or something right. like that he's Thanks. not like oh you have a different car in your garage today it's like no <laughs> nothing like that you know yeah uh, it's but it's definitely enough where it's like i know he has my phone number and so if it's like if something is out of line he might call me right. now not everyone has that scenario but it that would not have been the case if i hadn't I hadn't gotten to know him a li at least a little bit um but that's just not a good i think that's a good example but it also goes to say with this this kind of this whole scenario makes me think so much about just how we look at gun culture as a whole because we looked at that we look look at that when it comes to would you would you take that that same example and apply it to gun culture right so like if we started seeing an uptick in violent crime not in like the Minneapolis type like the 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 um domestic terrorism kind of level activity that is swimming in the crowd sort of insurgency kind of stuff where you're like, we're burning 150 buildings to the ground kind of thing. Not in that level, but le or if we're seeing like, you know, uptick in violence and violent crime, would you expect gun culture and the gun community to start restricting what they, what they allow publicly? I'd like to say that if I, I'm going to separate this by age, because I do think there's a difference in thought pattern. Okay. Uh, for our old school FUDs. Yes. 1000% they're going to start to restrict shit because okay. they're not, they're, I honestly, I'm not gonna say all of them, but a lot of like the old school two A dudes are two A casuals. To keep it a fucking buck, I'm, we're right there. We're right there with you, right? <laughs> it's it's you know it's 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 I, I'm not I'm not disagreeing with it. There's plenty of people out there, and the ones who aren't know they're not like, or, or we know who you are, right? <laughs> but yeah. that is a big difference between like older gun culture and newer gun culture. Is that like older gun culture is very like how do you how do you say it like they're very like you you if you go to an outdoor range and it's run by fuds you know it is because they're you can already hear the yelling before you even like unbox your ar or whatever yeah. and like okay dude 100 percent. so that's i would say i would say i would definitely depend on the who but i would i would say for the younger crowd no mm -hmm. uh, for the older crowd yes i i believe at some point in time that i'm like well our boys in blue and you know i'm like oh stop oh my god back back to blue that's where we're going with this like mm -hmm. <laughs> most of them are most of the old crowd i, I won't say a bunch of the new crowd but i would say most of the old crowd are a bunch of status and they don't even realize they're status um and i think that in and of itself is a huge problem and i thought that's that's why i think the new going culture fight so fucking hard to get where it's at Mm -hmm. um is because they've always been beholden to you know the, the you know the, the thin blue line and the fucking what i'm like dude they're not that's not they're not there for you like i don't know if you understand this or not and i know i have friends that are cops i'm aware that i a fan of cops actual job essentially is the, so not sheriffs they're elected officials but more so like cops city cops
Yeah, it's a difficult. It's a very difficult problem. I recently had uh, Trung Nguyen, uh, or I, I can never pronounce his last name, but Trung yeah. on from We Go Home. He was a SWAT officer in a, in Chicago. Yeah, um, and he was taught. He he recently retired, so he had a little bit more freedom to talk about some things. And I came from Minneapolis. I we, we, we I was living in Minneapolis during the 2020 riots and the George Floyd thing. And so like the whole defund the police thing was such a presence there. And it, it it's destroyed. It has like to no to no to no short matter of the words, it has destroyed communities. That whole attitude has completely leveled el elements of Minneapolis. But we started getting into pro we started getting into conversations of, about it, or a, a, a conversation regarding the, the proper position of police within a, a society they have to be integrated it can't be like it can't be adversarial um it can't be like uh, uh overseers and underlings kind of thing it has to be like police officers are part of the community they have investment there socially physically whatever um but then we also were running into a problem of we we're running into kind of a question when it when it comes to this kind of stuff being well how well, how should the pop how, like what is a how does a society properly order itself when it comes to gun culture, individual responsibility, individualism, uh, as opposed to like statist solutions, right? Because I mean, yeah, we want the crime to go down in Minneapolis. And what they're going to do is they're going to crack down on the non-criminals. They're going to completely, you know, the, the same thing. Like, I don't, I know this is not a correct statistic, but it's, you look at gun violence in, in the United States, like, you know. You know, you got all you can you can we can complain about all of the, the, the lying and, and but the simple thing about it is, you know, they're the, the average citizen is being told that they're a felon because they have a brace on their gun, whereas which is a one ethical question, whereas, you know, all the other things are going on right all the other crime and 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 violence and activities going on and so instead of it being a political question on like you know how do we attack raskin or whoever it's more it should be more focused on i want to see more focus on like how do we just it's my it's my it's my neighborhood i'm i'm, I'm not waiting for somebody out there to fix my neighborhood right you, you know there's some personal accountability for the for the place that you are residing in essentially yeah, I mean, it's it's if you're gonna call it your country, act like it's your country for goodness sake. It's really strange. Yeah, like it's if if it's your country, it's your country. It's not their country. It's not China's country. It's not Amer. It's it's like if you're an American, it's America is your country. This isn't some sort of pseudo patriotic chest thumping. It's you're not a renter in this country you're you are a part owner of this this country so act like it yeah no that's definitely that's that's a really good point as is, is uh kind of policing side now what does that policing look like so mm -hmm. to speak? is it is an entirely different question um because we do have to realize too that crime is a real thing and there's one thing that criminals have against standard citizens is that they're way more apt to use violence than we are um and i would say that because they've already been to jail they've probably already been you know, they've already done those things and now i think it's going to really come down to what are you what, what's going to be your price how far are you willing to go to ensure that this this cancer doesn't infest your society right mm -hmm. um and i think that's an, another and I, i'm huge on asking questions i was going to ask questions today uh to the, to the newer civilian community that's that's hopping into all the gun stuff and stuff like that and i'm like well what's your fucking price too because i think everyone gets hyper focused on one or two scenarios in which they get to validate all their bias uh all their all their confirmation bias with all the things that they bought mm -hmm. and i think it, they mold their training towards and they don't realize at every single point in time the the civilian culture is going to be the underdog and fighting any group that's in the United States, right? Whether that be cartels, criminal organizations, the government, we're always going to be the underdog. So should that stuff be trained? Yes. But is that the is that what that fight's going to look like? Is the question that we have to ask in earnest and in truth? Because I think that doesn't happen. I think we just throw something out there and we're like, oh, well, what who, what's that fight look like for you? Mm -hmm. Is it civil unrest? Is it civil war too, like everybody wants it to fucking be? Like that's mm -hmm. a fucking terrible idea. Um, or is it just like standard catastrophe, 
happening. And then we, you know, we do our preparedness thing and we help other people out and insulate them. From shit. Because that's the best thing you can fucking do. If you really want people on your side and keep them from possibly being an adversary is insulating them from the event. So. Mm-hmm. Well, let's do, I, let's, let's kind of, let's, let's uh, spend, some, let's spend some time on that subject. Right. Cause you, 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 I'm familiar, we're familiar in gun culture with the, um, the post hoc justification. Right. It's the, the post hoc justification of buying a gun. Right. So like, you know, I, I, I wanted this thing because I was concerned about this, this very specific narrow scenario. Right. Oh, my goodness. You know, um, I live I live on a ranch, so I need to get a gun. I might as well get an SR-25. Right. You're like, well, I mean, OK, dude, you know, you do you. But like, you know, this is it's kind of like. You know, or, or or whatever. Right. There's there's there's. Anything from like maybe can't you just tell can can you just tell me you wanted to get a shotgun? Not that it's the best tool for home defense. It's completely okay. You know, like no one's, but no, and 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 I and I and I will one hundred percent make the clarity. You cannot separate the <laughs> practicality concept of the utility of a firearm from its justification. You cannot separate that. Like it is a tool. It does a thing maybe i'll never do the thing right it's we would you know if you're gonna be like oh you know you know oh, marcus you know did you uh, uh i just want to let you know i bought an entire dewalt and milwaukee drill set i hate carpentry you know you're like why because well i might need to build the ark you're like you're not you're not gonna build the ark dude you know like yeah I, i'm not into that kind of boatsmanship but <laughs> I mean, uh, it'd be it'd be really cool to you know have a sailboat, but whatever, right? And so, yeah. but my point is, you know, like my point is, there's a certain a bit like, you know, there is you cannot tell me, it's 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 not that. It's always the difference between like evaluation and justification, right? Like I can tell you, I can understand why you did a, a thing, but I'm not necessarily justifying it. You know, you know, you know what I mean. Yeah, and so, yeah. or differently, like you know, you're justified, and you are 100 percent justified in buying that 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 handgun. I have no idea why you did it, you know. And your story about it being used in the case of a bear attack in rural Chicago or urban Chicago is not really, you know, wrong. Bears, they're your team, I guess. Sports ball, sports. But um, you get my point, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, Chicago is on the front of top of mind lately, but whatever. Um, <laughs> So then changing our mentality from uh, not changing our mentality. I lost my whole train of thought. The ship has left the station dink right in the garbage can. I was going with the thing. Um, The civil war, we're going to stick to the civil war one, right? You said the, the citizens are always a step behind. Yeah. And we're always a step behind because we're reacting to something. Okay. Which makes sense. Like I wouldn't want it every other, any other way. I wouldn't want the. I wouldn't want to look at the active citizen, the citizenry of the United States, and have them be on some sort of mass scale witch hunt meets vigilantism problem. Because that would be like, ugh, you know, like the purpose of owning a gun isn't to f- is, is is so that I may preserve my life, that I may live it. It's not to give justification for my living. Mm, okay. So. No, you're not wrong. Uh, so, so I guess I'll bring up a. Uh, um, so this was the post I was going to make earlier, uh, and it's funny because usually the people that have buy-in, you'll see roughly the same response almost every time. I've noticed it because I've asked it a quite quite a few times, even as far as values, go, right? Values, character, and you know, I'm like, where is your line? You need to understand. Like if you were going to have a bunch of people in your team, quote unquote, you have to know they're fucking. You have to know what the line in the sand is for them. Mm-hmm. You have. If there are people that are willing to do way worse shit in order to, you know, in, in your team, and you can't account for that, that's that's the wrong answer. <clears throat> that's that's when you have people running off in the middle of the night and murdering villages of women and kids. So you you, you kind of have to understand like where that line is for your crew, or whomever. And so I'm like, all right, cool. And I asked, I asked the question, or someone else asked the question. I think it was uh, X-Ray Alpha or uh, Matt Pranka. And he's like, well, what's the fight look like? And in stereotypical fashion, they're like, uh, well, and they answer a question with a question. 
I'm like, why are you answering a question with a question? And I was like, it's, it's like, they're like, oh, well. And then some dude like half ass quotes the fucking constitution. And I'm like, okay, well, what does that look like? It's like, it's not you. It, I can almost guarantee it's not going to be you bearing arms against the government, like in a, in a kinetic fashion. I don't think it will look like that for, for a very long time. And it won't be accepted mm -hmm. by, by the general populace. You're talking about, um, 1776 right not it wasn't fought by the majority of americans it was fought by a hyper small amount of fucking americans backed by french and other fucking and other outside of that mm -hmm. so people don't understand like i'm like you start murdering cops outright you start murdering government officials outright it's not, it's gonna put a terrible taste in people's mouths and I'm like you're also fighting a propaganda machine that is very good at what it does mm -hmm. so you might be the good guy in your own story but the prop the propaganda that's going to be getting out over the internet will make you a fucking homegrown terrorist and you'll be hunted for every for the rest of your fucking life yeah there's a there's a certain benefit and i and i don't mean this casually as in like there once you once you open up that door you can never go back people never who are back. people who are like and i think i think i think people who have experienced violence in a in a let's like, just say a military sense recognize that right this is i think and this is a this is again i think a huge uh, this is i know it, it, it's way too it's way too it's way too honest to reach common conversation when it comes to our country but it's all the people who are capable of violence are not participating in it because when they know once you open up that line not 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 even nationally but individually like once i permanently change my worldview of my living environment from home to deployment there is no going back yeah and for many people minneapolis was that for and then it, it did kind of i'm not saying it went away but for many people minneapolis was that if i open this door there's no, there's no there's no putting the to the toothpaste back in the tube like if i go get violent in minneapolis in my backyard there's no going home from it and the people who did not have that who did not have the conscience to uh, understand that most of them ended up in a cell. Yeah. Thankfully, good news, right? You know, but it is. Um, so when it comes to the civil war question, yeah, we can we can criticize sort of the 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 sophists. Let's say it was called the sophists, and we can we can criticize the the answering questions with questions, people, and 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 I would agree with that. It's like, well, you're not very serious about it. And, yeah. and, and that's okay. You know, I just, it, it, the, 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 the measure of the question, I do think, I guess this is worth mentioning here while we're recording this, this, the, the episode that went most published this morning was a conversation, a solo conversation on civil war, but, um, that I've been reading on, I've been reading for a year, a couple of years on, on concepts of civil war explanations of civil war from like Mal left wing authors like Malcolm Nance to like, you know, more counterinsurgency insurgency theory to all this other kind of stuff. And, and, and I think, um, it's a messy business. It really yeah. is this idea of civil war. And mind you, like, dude, I, I've been hearing about the, the, the America is going to encounter a civil war since I was like 10. <laughs> before 9 11 i remember sitting i remember what it looked like I, the, just this weird snap image in my head talking to a, a friend of mine and i was like nine or ten years old and like not being this is the proto the, the most prototypical example of like i wonder if that would happen here and we're on like you know in the front yard of the house or something like that and it's just like it, this conversation has been around for a long time it's not going away this is, 20, mm -hmm. this is 20 years ago, 23 years ago or something like that before 9-11. And it's like, or maybe it was after or whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, and it's like, it's not that simple. It's not as simple as, oh, civil war. Like mm -hmm. you're not once, once you, once you, once you go, you know, like look at how long the Soviet era is trying to, the Soviet, Soviet regions are trying to recover from, the so the the Bolshevik Revolution a hundred years ago. I know it was more. It wasn't exactly hundred years ago. You have a point, but like that does not. That's like four or five generations affected quickly. Yeah. So. Yeah, like I said, I think there's a the, the fetishization of of war, especially from people that haven't been there. And I know there's it, there seems to be a line kind of between 
veterans and the civilians and they, every, every civilian thinks everybody that is a bro vet or a gatekeeper. And there are some, I'm not, I'm not discounting that fact. But I'm going to, I'm going to call you out there. You just said every civilian blank. So you, you okay. used it, you used a generalization True. to accuse some, uh, a generalized population of making a generalization. So, uh, and, and, and I say this as a veteran I'm, who's, who's done it myself. No, yeah, you're right. That was, uh, I'll, 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 <clears throat> I'll flip that around a little bit. There are quite a few, mm -hmm. a few civilians that would accuse lot, uh, many a veteran of being brevets, gatekeepers, mm -hmm. so, so forth. And like I said before, uh, before I got called out, which thank you for calling that out. That was probably that was not not in good taste. Um, this it, is what we're here for. It's not out yeah. of it's not out of, it's it's not out of malice. It's just no. I'm well aware, and I'm so here's the thing. I'm here to have the conversation, man. I, I, mm -hmm. If I say something that's like out of out of fucking tolerance or, and I might not have meant it the way that that came out. So mm -hmm. thanks for calling that out. Um, and those guys do exist, right? So yeah, there's a certain element of like the civilian population that holds animosity towards the military and veterans mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And it changes from person to person. And you know, it when you see it, because that, because they can't perceive anything that didn't come from the military as being anything other than like Matt best in short shorts and like, fine, fine, dude. <laughs> you know he's funny but like you know the whole bro vet thing like it's 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 it, it not everything is like yeah there's a yeah. certain part of that world that's extremely cringy but but like that we're we're, we're we're you're you're trading one 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 bag of exclusionary shit for another bag of exclusionary shit like okay let's move on what's the principle that you're saying that you what's the value that you're trying to argue for and the, the and then you end up finding out that there's a reason why uh there's these things called standards and holding standards is gatekeeping right you know holding standards is in a sense gatekeeping but it's just different you know people in ranger battalion gatekeep fat people out right yeah you're not wrong like like oh are you are you is your body mass index that big then you're not coming in why because you can't run the five mile yeah you know but sure there are exceptions you're not that unicorn move on exactly but i i so going back to the point of like there is a certain element of the civilian population which seems to be a little bit more ambitious or open to welcoming of the idea of civil war I would agree with you. I think there's still a minority. I think the majority of people, I no. think, I, I think, I think, I think the majority of the civilian non-veteran batch of, uh, of, of, of people in, in this country are concerned about the likelihood of them being targeted as if they were a foreign, as if they were a violent extremist, even though they're not like they're, they're they don't have, they don't have clear rules of engagement anymore. Um, right. You know, it could be anybody from somebody who's uh, involved in like Mike Glover's um, oh, God. American contingency thing where it's like, you know, I use this platform. I have this platform that I'm a part of that has given me a sense of purpose and involvement in community where I can I can, you know, add value to my immediate neighborhood because we have communication. Um, and then I end up being on a targeted watch list for, uh, you know, going and helping my neighbor cut down a tree that was get threatening hitting a power line. And I'm an arborist. Arborist. I, I, I cut trees for a living. Yeah. You know, you know, it's like that kind of stuff. Yeah. I traded, you know, I traded homemade peach jam for 556. And now I'm on a terrorist watch list because I did it on, you know. Online or, <laughs> you know. Like what? Why? Like yeah. it's crazy. It's just bartering. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. So I mean, I hope that rift kind of closes up here soon. And I think that it'll start to I think it'll get there eventually. Um I think what, what's the rift you're talking about? I, I might have muddied that statement. I want to be clear on this one. So like yeah, so like once again, I think there is a rift, like there's certain I, I don't know if I could say figures that just seems like all people are kind of opposed to like, there's like, Oh, you're saying this because you were a military. And like, I, I made a statement beforehand that um, most people seek out people that have experience in the job that they're looking for. Yes. So if you're looking to do this thing. You're going to find someone of experience in that arena, like lived experience to mm -hmm. learn. From. And I got quite a bit of flack and I was like, why is this even an argument? And I was like, 
what job have you ever done where you you get taught by somebody that's just as new as you? Like, I've, I've never seen that. Mm-hmm. And it, it, I, don't, I don't know if it was just because uh, it, it came from someone that wasn't liked, like the original poster mm. was one that did, people just don't like for whatever reason. And I was like, maybe that's what it is. And they just they don't like the person. So they buy like de facto don't like what they say, even mm-hmm. though what they could absolutely hold value. Yeah. <laughs> So and once again, I might be, I'm seeing this through a very small lens of my, of my existence. So yep. it's all total at best. So mm-hmm. largely, like you're saying, it's probably not like that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I guess the small risks that I'm seeing, hopefully they come together. And- yeah. I mean, my, from my perspective, I don't see as much of a rift there. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, I, I think, I think the, it was, I, I think it was semi- um, it was semi-solid 10 years ago mm-hmm. where the, there, it, there, there was, I think it was semi-solid 10 years ago where, where in many ways, kind of the, the, the American culture in regards to gun culture and veterans went from veterans on a pedestal to like, but what veterans on a pedestal in this kind of weird, like honorary weepy fashion where it's like thank you for your service and your sacrifice. Like, bro, I had a good time. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it wasn't all misery. There was a lot of pain and, and emotional frustration and suffering that went through. But like I got out cause I thought the war was over, not because we were going to go into another one, you know? So there was more to it. And then, and then you had like the, the, the kind of Matt best era, and and what people refer to as the bro vet thing and i i'm not i'm not completely over i'm tr- i'm trying not to completely overgeneralize but like that kind of aesthetic was very much so no like wh- th- we have our own military culture like there is this sort of veteran culture and like veterans don't have to get at, no longer have to get out of the military and go get a desk job and 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 feel like they're they're they have to leave that entire world behind and perhaps it goes south when you start viewing military like a frat house where yeah. like the, the 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 rest of your life is spent remembering you know living the glory days of your your 2009 deployment or whatever sure mm-hmm. same issue that we have with people who never get out of college never leave the college mindset because they were a football player i don't yeah. know i'm not a sports ball guy but I mean, you know, I I still look fondly back on college, and it was five years ago. Mm-hmm. Wow, it was five years ago. Yeah, you're old, man. I need to get my act together. Um, <laughs> I could have had a doctorate by now. That's how bad I am. But needless to say, uh, my point in all of this kind of in that in that layer of the conversation is that like, yeah, you know, I can I can see what the 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 veteran culture did, but now I think we're seeing so much more of like veterans are kind of trying to from not veterans it's just how, we're trying to figure out how to add value everyone's trying to figure out, a lot of people are trying to figure out how to add value and a lot of, and many many people are absolutely not interested in adding value except for their useless witty remarks on i'm just holding people accountable man like do yeah. that no you're not you're being a sophist you're not you're not just i get it we don't want to over venerate people we don't want to put mike glover on a pedestal as if he, his word is gospel we don't yeah. want to put GBRS group on a pedestal where everything they do has to be amazing. Yeah. But like you, you can do that to anything. You can make anything into an idol. So very true. Yeah. There's but the, the exact opposite of the, uh, the Kings of bro vets. And then now you're talking to the guys that are like <laughs> essentially the opposite, the contrarians, the, mm-hmm. the contra- that don't want to be known as contrarians. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Well, like, just 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 get rid of the advocate part. I'm just being a devil. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. you know, super edgy, bro. Yeah. Um so let's close up on let's 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 close up on one last subject and talk about something that is it, let's talk about like the bigger picture when it comes to Americana. The you and I had a had a brief conversation on a short live stream. Thank you for having me on by the way. Absolutely. Um you know, and we should definitely do it again. Let me know if you want to, if you're going to, if you have a certain subject and, and I can try to fit it in my schedule and we can, and we can do stuff. I'd love to keep having conversations. But the part that intrigued me about what you're saying was, you know, don't, don't, it, there's a certain, 
if you're focused on it, I'm this is me paraphrasing you, but if you're focused on what's happening in Washington, DC and not what's happening in the classroom, you might be missing the point. Yeah. I was like, okay, that's, that's a useful piece. I don't have kids um, right now, but it's like, what were you getting at with that? And, 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 and I know there's no way to make this non-political, but what were you, what was your point there? <laughs> um, yeah. So forgive me ahead of time for the political shit. Um, essentially uh, with, I would say the culture war, that encompasses mm-hmm. so, two way and everything else, right? Mm-hmm. The left showed up beating their chest for the last ten years, roughly, right, with LGBTQ and everything else, mm-hmm. and they were the front lines. They have no problem doing that. And uh, you you cut out twice there. <laughs> they have they something front lines. They have no problem doing that. Uh, I said, the, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, I said the the LGBTQ or the alphabet community and and every other community, small French community out there showed up to the culture war, beating their chest, fucking, you know, war drums and all, Mm -hmm. Um, essentially changing culture from the inside out, making everything. You started hearing the word normalize this, normalize that. And they normalized a lot of bullshit that shouldn't have been normalized. In my, in my opinion, this is only my opinion. And the other side of the spectrum, or I'll, I'll deem them the right quote unquote, um, didn't show up at all. (laughs) <laughs> quite frankly uh, or either that or they just got steamrolled in the fucking culture war to where they changed e- everything of all facets you know uh, finance the education system stuff like that they changed it all with, without much of a fight right mm-hmm. there was it's not having a common core or um, what is it critical race theory in schools and, and, mm-hmm. and, and that stuff that's you know that for, for two and five year olds way earlier than, it, than it's supposed to be introduced to their lives and I'm like, well, I'm like, it's all happening because like you guys were only worried about who's getting voted in every four years. Meanwhile, ignoring your local elections, your, you know, whoever your governor is, the people that influence your life on a daily basis, you ignored the entire time. And I'm like, and that's why the goddamn always is because mm-hmm. that stuff ever mattered. It's only who Trump versus Biden or Obama versus McCain or whoever. Mm-hmm. It's only big heads where let's be real at the federal level you're going to have very little influence over 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 politics very little if any at all um but your local elections your you know your, your mayors your aldermen your all that have direct almost direct influence over it. and you can talk to those people you can touch those people every fucking day mm-hmm. and you're not you have these people who have no idea who their mayors are or their governors or or when their primaries are held when they can talk to them, can they call their offices, any of that stuff. And I'm like, well, I'm like, are we going to pay attention to that stuff? Because that's stuff that's actually affecting you personally, your kids personally, every fucking day. Mm-hmm. And so, like, we, we can't be missing the forest, you know, <clears throat> what is it, missing the forest for the trees? Is that the saying? I don't know. My name is Forrest. I never paid attention. <laughs> so, um, we, we missed the forest for the chocolates with the running. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's pretty much it is like, I think people are focusing only macro and missing all the micro. I would actually. agree with you wholly. I wholeheartedly agree with you. Like it's, it is, it's very, it's, if I, I, I would agree with you in this. I do. I do in the sense of it's a dual, it's a dual problem. It's, it, I think, I think in one hand it's, It's a it's it's this it's a dual problem of like yes I can I can have issues with what's happening on the federal level like the ATF's move against the with, against braces is a federal level problem yeah and the solution one of the one of the main solutions that's being presented is a local level where it, states areas jurisdictions are basically saying your ruling has no validity here we will not work on your behalf kind of thing okay they are willing to do that because of other reasons good. You know, this, these are these are parts. It, you, there are there. Um, your local sheriff of Nottingham may not be able to trump the king of the country, but we don't live in fictional Robin Hood era. We live in very real now time, and um, the culture war problem. I I I, I mean. Yeah, I, the one the one example that I see this thing working out is 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 the gun culture issue, like on the political or on the social conversation, is that all of the prominent people who are known for having any conversation on gun culture are not 
firearm literate. They're they're very you know the the, the David Hogs of the world and the, the, yeah. the like you know the assault weapons ban people and the your right to own a gun does not trump my right to life. You don't have a right. You know, it's like that. That's not an argument. That's that's a false dichotomy. In fact, you know, the the, the you're just you're just dealing with. <clears throat> I don't know how to say it another way. So I wanted to, I wanted to try to find out how we. I wanted to keep having this conversation in a way that was, like, useful for the individual because I think of it this way too. I can tell. I can. I can get on this on this on this show on this radio station and say, you know, focus on local elections. Sure. Okay. So how would you take that? How would you take that concept and exclude it from the political and focus and, and turn it into the personal? So for, I mean, honestly, even but you say turn it into the personal, do you mean like get the individual on board with that? Is that what you're? <laughs> well, like um, we're talking about, we, we started where we start, you know, you're, you have a, you have a, a specialization in covert surreptitious entry. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, you could. I can't defeat the NSA tomorrow. Right. right. You know, and so so we're talking about surveillance levels, home security, you know, all from as far as like big picture questions of should the country exist as a surveillance state? How do we have influence over that to the individual i can change the locks on my house which as we were explaining earlier isn't you know isn't the the best thing like how would you do that how would you take that same value set of the same kind of virtue you made a claim of of like don't you you're getting so caked into the the biden versus presidency missing the culture war and then missing what's at home how would you apply that to the individual without having it just be about the presidency Ooh. in regards to like security individual success and, and something like that like individual values and stuff so i would say the so my buddy reaper he does this he, you might know him on here uh reaper one one point one he says it, it's easier. is this nick yeah yeah <laughs> nick and i were in at the same time i just never really had any interaction with him oh wait, actually it might not be wait uh, I, 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 I'll i figure that out and I'll talk to you all offline talking, about it. You're talking about like the Reaper, like Florida, like the, the sniper guy, right? Yeah. Irving, yeah. Nick Irving. Oh, no, not that. No, not that. Nick. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, different. No, not that. Not that guy. I've never even spoke to him actually, okay. <laughs> but um, he's on, he's on IG. He's the guy that pretty much pumps out like fry the brain. <laughs> he's like, make them read fry the brain, you know, for whatever. <laughs> and, He's like, yeah, man. He's like, it's like, it's a lot easier to influence someone's way of thinking versus outright like trying to debate them over something. Because most people, when you debate them about something, they get defensive, they shut down. There's nothing about them that's actually ingesting what you're trying to give them. So it's a little bit easier to kind of just like casually have the conversation with people, not debate them, but casually have the conversation to kind of subvert their their way of thinking. And in, in doing it that way. And I feel like that's probably the best way to do a lot of stuff. And that's how you influence a lot of people, right? And there are books on how to influence people and having them kind of come to the conclusion that the way they're thinking, it might not be the most optimal way. I won't say wrong, but not the most optimal. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope that makes sense. So kind of trying to subvert their thoughts with like, oh, like, well, what about this? And let's, let's talk about, let's talk about it a little bit. Are you, are you okay with like how this kind of goes? And then they kind of think of it to themselves and like, oh, well, Maybe I'm not okay with that shit. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that probably has a longer lasting effect in the long run because they came to the conclusion on the, on their own versus it being pounded into their thoughts. Yeah. I, 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 I kind of, I think of it. There's, there's some ways that I've seen, I think I've thought of it lately too, is like one of them is there's kind of the, 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 the meme of Ben Shapiro, you know, debate me and, <laughs> and being an academic philosopher, there's a room for debate. And, 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 and a, a debate is, you know, we is, is partially built on this idea that we can, you know, be academics and come in our robes with our stacks of books and be like, ah, oh, yes, that's modus ponens, my modus tollens, ah, you know, this kind of stuff. And you're, you're using, it's not like Hogwarts magic. I mean, that's just like, those are, you know, um, logic terms used in, in formal logic, but, uh, are your modus ponens is my modus tollens, which is me pronouncing it probably wrong but doesn't matter um 
and so my point on this one is uh it's it's a, it's a syntax term uh so my my point in this thing is 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 like there's a place for debate yeah um and then and 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 the the one of the surest way to, to de defeat an honest intellectual is give him a dis make him face a dishonest anti-intellectual where it's it's you know a sophist of some sorts where it's just like I, you know I'm I, you're gonna play by a set of rules and I'm gonna I'm gonna take advantage of the, that set of rules. Yeah. One of the you know one of those classic examples in communication is that when two people are having a conversation, if one of them is a genuine actor and the other one is a disingenuous actor, the genuine actor is going to try to view the other person's argument in the best light. The disingenuous actor is just going to twist it and lie. You know, this is where you get the everything is racist argument. It's like, yeah, OK, well, if I can't beat you, I'll just call you a thing. Yep. Um, you know, I'll just call you something bad. Uh, there you go. You know, it's you can tell me that um, ad hominem is, is a logical fallacy, but I'll tell you it's effective. And and I'm not. And just because it's effective doesn't mean it's just or moral. And so yeah. we're you know building this series of complicated problems. But then, you know, and gun culture will always have to wrestle with the reality of it's a it's a very much so rugged individual subject of like individual responsibility, individual capability, being an individual as part of a team. But it has to exist within a within a community and that community building will always be difficult. I mean, it's easy to build a cult on none of us are valuable, but we're strong together. I mean, it's easy to build a, 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 a like a cultural movement on um you know we the oppressed or it's easy to build all these things it's really hard to build cultural foundation on things that are true because i mean it's it's difficult it just is it, it's difficult because it's not always emotionally satisfying to think that you get to storm the capital and uh that's the wrong line it's not storming the capital that i'm looking for um because I don't, this wasn't meant to be a, a reference to Jan, January 6th. I just kind of lost it. It was supposed to be a reference to something else. Um, you know, but it's it's great to, it's, it feels great to be part of the revolution until you're the revolutionary facing the wall kind of thing. Right? Like, yeah. You know, it's like, oh, the I wonder how many people in France after they overthrew the government in, in Paris and they were amidst the reign of terror we're struggling with extreme levels of uh, uh, cognitive dissonance. We're like, I never had anything to do with this. It wasn't me. I didn't. I didn't advocate advocate for the guillotining of my neighbor. That was somebody else. Yeah. We can blame Robespierre. You know. Oh, it was. It was. It was. It was. It was somebody else's problem. And so that that moral weight. Like, yeah, we can talk about whether or not it has utility or it's effective or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's a moral question. But um, we actually, what we should do is we should wrap it up for the day and we should have you on again. It's, it's been really great talking to you, Marcus. I, I love here. appreciate it. And likewise, definitely want to be on again. In conclusion, what do you want to leave the audience with? Uh, yeah, not much, man, but I'll, I'll leave you guys my plug in case you guys want to come on and get challenged and have your ideas challenged and, have an honest conversation as honest as I can be. if I have him <laughs> if I have redacted and forced here in the uh, comment section I'm sure he'll keep me honest as well so I'll jump in yeah page <clears throat> at sky Power underscore actual on IG or at entryco on IG and then you have www.clickentryco.com for classes if you want to schedule privates um yeah I would definitely say for the average person listening to this or actually any person listening to this, practice a little bit of introspection. Uh, it's sorely missing today and it could definitely benefit you and everyone around you if you're honest with who you are when you strip everything away. So that's all I got. All right, Marcus. Well, Marcus, uh, Marcus, the Sky Pirate actual of Covert Entry Co. It's been great having you on the Redacted Culture Cast. Uh, thank you for the last minute, accepting our last minute invite. And thank you for kind of elaborating on both skill set development and a little bit on how we think about things. I think next time we can get into a little bit more on, um, you know, let's just call it the philosophy of entry. That yeah. sounds weird. Uh, um, but how you look at, you know, I don't want to I don't want to give away the goose or give away all your coursework, but I'd love to hear how you think about um I love uh, when that. I'll, I'd love to hear how you think about more on like um, 
not surveillance, but like how you would approach target validity and stuff like that. And like, and, and not only that, cause, cause I mean, it is, here's the kind of the, the ending question of, you know, when I, even as citizens of this country and having different levels of, of professional experience, and even though we believe in things like rights to bear arms, it gets very uncomfortable when you encounter somebody who's building a legitimate target package. And and part of the reason why that is is because it's a very, very serious matter. Now, it doesn't mean that I think every it doesn't mean that it's you know, it's not it's it's not doesn't mean that it's not um maybe permitted. It's just it's 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 a it's a very realistic thing. Like if if I were to go over to your house and you'd be like, look, I have a hand grenade, it would be like oh. Not because of its legality, but it's like that's that's a very that's a casual thing to be throwing around there. All right, let's you know. So, and, <laughs> good story for you. We, we can talk about that one off, and it's a, it's a quick story. It's fa fairly quick. Alrighty. But, yeah. Well, we'll have to close <laughs> it off before we leave too many cliffhangers for everybody else. This has been the Redacted Culture Cast, where our primary focus is the philosophy of violence, which and by that we mean how we think about violence, how we think about culture, and how we think about uh, what we believe to be right and true and good, especially when it comes to a very messy world with a lot of grit and gristle to deal with. My guest today, Marcus, thank you for joining us. And for everyone who is listening, you can always head over to redactedllc.com. That's where you'll find our merch list. And you can head over to uh, redactedculture.locals.com if you want to support the show. Other than that, we will see you here on Instagram, across the web, and in the real world, because that's where we live. Take care. <laughs>